Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Hello and welcome to part three of our series of interviews with John Butler, the 84-year-old YouTube sensation and author of the Shepherd Walwyn book, Wonders of Spiritual Unfoldment. Now this conversation carries on from our last one, and we start off with one of John's most famous stories, which was when he was eating his favourite pig or recycling love. He also looks at the difference between sinners and consumers. Are they the same thing? Um, and also his, his famous adage of to make whole, be whole. And we look at the upside of failure and depression. And we finish with the funniest additional information section ever written on a CV. Um, so I really hope you like it. And piglet, and then you you raised him on his own, and then and then you killed him, yes. and then you ate him. Yes. Yeah. Well, what else can you do with a pig when it gets <laughs> See, pigs get bigger. This, this but, is what happens with a pig. It starts off with a little cuddly piglet, but you've got to feed it, don't you? Well, and the more food you put into it, the bigger it gets, and eventually it's so big <laughs> it takes over the whole place. But, do you know, I've got a friend who's running that experiment right now. Her husband bought her what was called at the time a micro pig. I don't know if you heard of that. No. So, well, and that's because they don't exist, uh-huh. right? What it was was a baby pig. Yes. So someone had some clever marketing ideas. Like, I want to sell some piglets. So he yes. described them as micro pigs. And they said, oh, no, they just grow to be the size of a dog. And they don't, they didn't at all. They grew to be not, they were normal pigs. And so, and so this pig kept growing and they've had to move house. <laughs> and, <laughs> had to, and it got to the stage one point where the pig became territorial because they're super smart animals, right? Yes. Rachel came home one day and she said, I think we've been burgled. And because um, the house has all this been wrecked. And, um, and when they played back the video on the, on the security cameras, the pig had managed to work out how to use a door and managed to make his way around the house. And, and also it became really rather possessive of, of her. So wouldn't let him, wouldn't let the husband in the house. And so they had to, to move house. And now they live next door to a field where the pig is basking in this, in this piggy glory. And they can't bring themselves to, to eat it. But the, the thing that I really took from that was how it was the, was the love. And he said that, and he said, pig and I had loved each other in life, in death. Yeah. And at least I felt the bond continued. It was an important lesson. Somehow it seemed to me my pignet never died because yeah. you, you actually the love is and you said he said the, the the love with which we work is not lost but recycled yes, exactly. and the value of the food we eat is most certainly connected with the quality of man and conditions which produce it absolutely i'll made to that it's amazing that i wrote that i wrote that when i was how old was i 30 long time ago this is amazing isn't it what i knew he's absolutely right yes i i, I took my, this was dead serious um, this was a huge lesson for me, and I ate that whole pig. Do you know, it was a big pig. You know, a, a, a pig's about ninety uh, percent fat, uh, but that was how what everybody ate in the old days: fat, bacon, salted. And it kept. We hung it from the cellar in the house, and it took me three and a half years to eat that pig. I ate every morsel of it. And, uh, of course, at the end, it was all festooned with green mould, but only on the outside, inside. But it did begin to get a bit strong. But anyway, I, I ate it. It didn't do me any harm. <laughs> and honestly, who would want to go out and buy meat after that? Because it's absolutely true that that, that love with which I love... we. Well, I think the pig loved me. We both loved each other. And, uh, and, and that came back to me. I ate that meat with reverence. And, and of course, that led me on to realise that the vegetables that I was growing then, if I put love into my work, 
that knob becomes part of the vegetable, therefore part of the nourishment. Therefore, I'm nourishing the consumer in that way. And isn't honestly, if, if you eat a, a, like a birthday cake cooked by your mother with loving care, isn't that different from just going out and buying a cake in the supermarket? Oh, 100%. Of course, it's yeah. everybody knows that. Well, so it is with farming. Yeah. Every potato we ate was grown with TLC. Every grain of wheat was grown in that way. Think how the whole society would be nourished. Isn't this the real work of a farmer to, to first of all, cultivate this spiritual um, awareness in himself and put that into his work? Hence, it, it, it flows out. Yes. You see, this is really what prayer is all about. Prayer is, is this raising of consciousness, this raising of, of, the, of the finer qualities of life. Oh, I just, and do you know, and I, I just think, and when I'm, I was thinking, because in the, you know, in the emails you're saying how you don't, you're not farming anymore and stuff, it's like, well, you just haven't stopped. You've just got, and I know in the, at the end of the book, you talk about being a farmer to, to others. Yes. And I just think that, so the, the lessons that I take is working in, working in business. The lesson I take, one of the biggest ones was, was if you is follow, follow your love, because that you loved farming and, and you loved animals and, um, and also, and be open, because I think I think Shirley brought more animals to the farm, didn't she? Her her impact was well, to, because there were two of us, we could we could keep more. Brilliant, and and it's that, and so so find something that you love, but also that the, what you did to make that how you wanted to work, mm. you made an e- economic they made the economics fit around that to yeah. some extent. I know it was a, I know you could have been a lot richer with more acreage, farms, you know, machinery, chemicals, and stuff like that, but. Then it would have been it would have impoverished you in a different way. So you found a way of making the economics work for you. you know, dear, I, uh, yes, and I suppose I don't know. I suppose economics had been invented a long time ago, but 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 of course, uh, this uh, economics like science, or these things are quite new phenomena, really. Farming used to be a way of life. Nobody thought of it as a business. And then it became gradually more and more of a business. And then science came along and became agro-business. And, and economics came in and people started costing everything. And, and all this seemed ever more alien to me and the, and the opposite to, to, to my better instincts. And uh, I had a very good father, really. In some ways, he was very strict. I was a bit frightened of him, really. But he was an artist, and I think he had a good understanding. I remember once I, I, I'm talking to him and worried that I couldn't make farming pay. And, and forgive me for saying this, because I'm going to swear. But uh, he said, bugger the money. <laughs> bless his heart. Yeah. I think that was the one. The, I, I, oh, I'll always bless him for saying that to me. <laughs> Bugger the money, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't think of a better principle to live by. Follow your heart. Follow your heart, my dears. Well, do you know, and I and I just think the way that that you and Shirley treated treated weeds. Yes. Right. So if if managers and leaders treated their people the way that you and Shirley treated weeds, <laughs> we would not have trouble in the workplace. Well, of course, because we would. there was love in everything you did, and 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 going back to the, you know, if if if. Uh, if you're going to eat lettuce, or then honour the lettuce. Grow it, grow it beautifully, grow it caringly, and honour the lettuce as you eat it, because the sacrifice is willing. From what I took from from your writings, is that they're they're happy for that for that sacrifice. Just honour it. Well, it's not much use us expecting our leaders. You see, it's, it's got to start with me. It all starts with me. I am the first of sinners. I am the one at fault. So. Start clearing up our own act, my own act. And then you see when, as he says in the good book, to the pure, all things are pure, you see. And the more light you have in your own life, the less darkness you see. It's as simple as that. Mm. When you really see clearly, there is no more darkness. Surely the darkness ceases to exist, just like the sun sees no shadow. So it all starts with me. It's to see, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
and so is uh, evil. But, you know, I, I, what, so when you talk about being a sinner, I can look at how people talk about being a consumer mm. as the same thing, because all you do is, is take... And I know what you were talking about. You talk about natural law in the in the book about 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 first give. If you want, if you want to produce first give, and the way that you That's gave right. to the soil and, and nurtured the soil, right. and and the other key principle is that you acted in a way that made next year better. That next year's harvest was going to be better because you you wanted the soil this year right. and you cared for it in a way that that restored the soil and and That's kept right. it kept it strong. But I'm just wondering what your take is of. Of as as the, as we are as sinners, is what do you what do you take of, of us being made in God's image? What's your understanding of that? You know, because all, these answers to these questions are always I find best answered right here and now. He's just talking still. Here's the silence. And just to be silent. We could feel our bottom sitting on this bench. The bench is rather hard and I'm beginning to feel the bones of my bottom getting a bit uncomfortable feet are on the ground. And up to now, my tongue's been rattling away. But now it's become quiet. This silence has moved into first place, hasn't it? It's suddenly become the most apparent. You can't call it a thing, can you? But it's become obvious, hasn't it? Somehow the performance has merged into the scenery, as it were. First of all, this lovely grass, sunshine behind us, and then expanding into the silence, the space. The spirit. Now what am I? I, this body, be sitting around on this hard bench, this voice, haven't I merged into this infinite spirit? And I left the body behind, forgotten about it almost, and just expanded into this infinite spirit. Here are you and I sitting on this bench talking as two men. But actually, how many spirits are there? You got one and me another? A fly buzzing around on the camera? Or is there just one spirit containing us all? One infinite silence, infinite presence, infinite spirit. So what are we? What is man? We know this spirit is one spirit that incidentally can move around without crushing the grass. Isn't this what we are? This, is, this doesn't die, does it? It doesn't change. And it's forever with us. I am with you always. It's long before we, we fell into I am John, and you are Jonathan. Two separate men, two separate lives. We are one, one spirit. Your time or space, without age or difference. The image of God. Remember Adam in the Garden of Eden was singular, was one, wasn't he? One. He, he fell into division. And so, because he fell from immortality, he fell into mortality, and infected the whole world with his disease. Destroying everything in this world. 
world dies. Should the real world exist? Humanity is really a disease. It's, a, it's not what man is. It's absent, absent from the presence of God. So all the misfortunes of this life are basically that. So when in your... <clears throat> in the most the loving time that you, that you had... At Bikafen, God was present because love was present. Well, <laughs> you see, again, we need to be careful with these words because whatever we mean by God, who knows what it means when we talk about God? We talk about it like something in a supermarket, don't we? But you see, if we think of it in terms of the infinite, we're on fairly safe ground because the infinite is always beyond anything you see you, how do you you can't you know you can't parcel the sky into a packet and send it can you it may have been attempted mm. but currently no <laughs> <laughs> so how could you um i forget what you said just the other just a moment ago john so something, so, something. About, 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 so love was you said about in yes. god's love and on Bicker Fen, the way that you and Shirley behaved with everything, with every creature, is that you, you honoured the we. You honoured all of them. And so, and so in that sense, so the love was present. And, and you had the godlike power of, of, of life and death. Well, dear, let's just say we tried. <laughs> and, and sort of, and tentatively approached and picked up crumbs from the table. Got it. That's yes. about the scale of yeah. it, you see. Yeah. We talk so arrogantly, really, about about uh, about the love of God and what we could do with it, you know, so we were in control. But, um, but yes. really, all we do is scratch the surface of these things. So, so your efforts then were, 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 were sincere and loving efforts, and they came up short because you're not, because you're not well, in this current manifestation... You, you, you aren't, you don't have, you're not God, but you are, you know, you're, in, you're part of the infinite, but only in those moments when you, when you join back in here, back on earth, then it's always going to, it's always going to end in failure. That's right. Yes, that, that's correct. We, always, we never really fully measure up. We can't do the limited nature. You see. Just look at my body. You see, you look at me, I have to hobble around on two sticks these days. You know, the, the body fails, obvious, doesn't it? It's, it's got a limited life where my brain can only grasp you know, a tiny little yeah. proportion of what's, of what's there. But the understanding of beauty of anything is just well, childish to say the least, isn't it? We are, we are children, spiritual children, all of us. The, 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 the more experience I have of these great things, the, the more I understand. I feel like a beginner. Your child, understanding. I think that you know, from from my point of view, as a <clears throat> in approaching a fifty-year-old man, then I've taken a great deal from your example um, of your of your trials and failures. Um, as how does a man behave, or how can a man behave, and what are the responsibilities? I'm not talking about a man or woman. I'm talking about you know, I'm talking about both. But from my point of view. Is what is what is right action or the closest to right action that I can get, <clears throat> and what consideration do I give to others? And creating, how can I create harmony? <clears throat> how can I create harmony in my environment so that everybody, as many as all beings, can prosper as much as it is humanly possible for me? I have a fairly simple approach to this. <clears throat> <clears throat> Give me a 
need a drink. Are you okay? Oh, it's all right. My granddad used to say to me, as an idealistic little boy, keep your foot and feet on the ground, my boy, he'd say. since the days of the dinosaurs keep your feet on the ground because it immediately anchors you first of all to something that's still and steady the mother earth even if it's a concrete floor at least it's still in contrast to your crazy mind so you start taking the first step towards being quiet and at peace feet on the ground then listen and look quite miraculously this will take you through the you go fully with full attention. Attention. It will bring your mind to stillness. And then you will begin to see. Just if you want to see, if you want to understand, the first thing is to look, isn't it? Mm. We don't look. Honestly. Who's looking at what's in front of their noses? We're listening to our own silly voices all the time. Aren't we talking about me? Mm. Just to listen. If you listen particularly beyond the sounds, even in a, in a busy street, just listen beyond the traffic, you hear stillness. I promise you, if all the bombs in the world were going off, you could be in perfect stillness, perfect peace, completely undisturbed. Completely untouched, untouched by the virus, violence, by unpleasantness. Just just here, present. What does God say to you? I'm with you. Trust in God. Yeah, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. That's all we have to do. He's on the ground, not on the chair. Listen and go. And it's here, isn't it? Mm. It's obvious as ABC. Yeah. Why don't we see it? Then when we're present, look, we're talking about this dried up cloth. You treat everything instinctively, mm. like a fairy would, with light. Mm. And it's a, it's a key Everything part, is yeah. beautiful, isn't it? Everything yeah. is beautiful. What is not beautiful? Look at the grass around us. Well, that's we, a key part of its recreation, right? This table stretching across here. How magical, magical beauty is it? So immediately you, you treat everything with respect, with reverence, with care, with TLC. You can't do anything else, can mm. you? Look, I look at you. If you ask you, I'm... You've never heard of you, didn't know who you are. But naturally, we love each other. We can't do anything else. To look at anything is to love it. Mm. How could we hurt a hair of each other's heads? No. It doesn't exist, does it? To see somebody. It's just, I think we've forgotten and we've stopped looking at people, haven't we? And seeing. But people at anything. Yeah. We just don't see them. We are absent from the presence of God. That is the whole human condition. Lost in our thoughts. Lost sheep, just as Jesus tells us. To the cord, come back. Oh. So I want us to move into the, the second part of your book, um, which is the extraordinary. It's actually the, I mean, it's actually the better part of the book, right? I mean, it's, it's truly... The first part is great. The second part is is the realization. But before we do that, I just want to touch on on Russia because I don't feel that we can understand you without 
without understanding what Russia meant to you. <coughs> Russia will. <coughs> There's a great big uh, fat book I called. First of all, I called the book Oh Russia. Then uh, the most, of, the most of all my other books actually are start, start, start off with the title Mystic something or other. I changed the name to Mystic for Bearance. Because this is a wonderful, rather old fashioned word, for Bearance. And if any country in the world has been through the, the trials of this life, it's, it's Russia. My mother was Russian, went through the trials of the revolution and the dreadful civil war that followed. It was destroyed not only our family, but not, not a family in Russia went unscathed. Mum was sent to England, a little away from the refugee, a teenage girl, spoke no English. And had to find her own way. Um, eventually produced me. So that's within me. And um, I think it explains much of why I was finding so difficult to fit into this Western world. Not really understanding why. And then, Connie, this is another of those completely unexpected of my life which had never entered into my, remotely into my mind. I went through a dreadful period of depression in my little years. It all started with a woman. That's another story in itself. Another book called Mystic Love. I've talked all day about that if you like. But uh, um, anyway, I was drifting around in an absolutely hopeless state of homelessness. Everything nestless. And was invited, surprise, surprise, at the age of 51 to go to university and study Russian. So it cost me with any straw I did. And then I said, I sent me to Russia. I had about a half year in Russia, which were uh, very much an up and down experience. But the, the most amazing experience was. <coughs> So when you that feeling that you had then, I mean, I know you, I know you feel a sense of belonging here, right? Yes. As a twelve-year-old boy, yes. this is where you felt belong. But you were, it was you and nature. Yes. So was that the first time when you really felt at home with other people? I think it probably was. Yes. Wow. Yes. In fact, not probably. Yes. Yes, it was. I, I initially felt comfortable. Um, yes, among people in Russia. And of course, Russia has the most wonderful nature. The country. Yes. 
so much as once you live there and you understand the geography and the climate of the place, you will become so aware. Okay, it's a great story. I'm glad I wrote that book. And again, I never intended to write it. It was just a sequence of long letters home. Right. But, uh, of course, this may go as impossible language it took me ages to get confident in speech and writing. My brain at 51 isn't easy to learn such a difficult language. So I suppose that's why I wrote a lot. Well, no, it'd be hard anyone would, would think of taking that on at 51, right? <laughs> And then, and then spend, I mean, it's, it's effectively that's 10 years of your life, right? From 51 to really, early 60s. Yes, but, well, I was desperate. I, I, was so, uh, I was so desperate to find any, any uh, reason to exist, really. It, I had an awful depression. But thankfully, Russia pulled me out of that. I got interested in it and forgot to be depressed. If anybody knows about depression, Russians do. Poor dears, if you know what, if you know what, if you know what they've been through, you're not surprised. My mother had many years of depression. Who, who wouldn't have been no. through what she went through? Yeah, and it, 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 it passes on in families, doesn't it? Well, so it seems, yes. But um, yeah, we've had that, and the, the trauma of the the, the, the the collective trauma that the nation's gone through. Um, but just, I just want to wrap this up, John, and then we can get into the second part of the book. Yes, but I, I did say um, that I would, I would read out your, what you wrote on the back, on the bottom of your CV. And I've got friends who work in recruitment, and they're going to find it hilarious as I did. So, so this was your additional information, which people can sometimes say, I'm, you know, I'm a hard worker, or I can do Excel, or something like that. And you wrote, there is no category on earth where I feel I belong. No form that can hold me. Therefore, I think I seek expression for my freedom. Because I, I feel this freedom, I can help others to freedom. My sights are cast not backwards into definition, but forwards to the infinite. Don't fence me in. I will not be contained, labelled, categorised. I am a free spirit bound only to love. I live only to love. I will do anything for love. Grant me a channel for my love, and I will give my all. <laughs> then you write, not surprisingly, no one offered me a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I rather like that. I, I could write the same thing today. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm even a bit proud I wrote that once. <laughs> it's the nail on the head, doesn't it? But then, then you find yourself at the job centre, and then next thing you know, you're in Nottingham that's doing right. a degree in, in Russia. Yes, that's right. Yes. And your life changes again. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website www.shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>